If man were a static or intelligible being, such as angels are thought to be, his life would have a single guiding interest, under which all other interests would be subsumed. His acts would explain themselves without looking beyond his given essence, and his soul would be like a musical composition, which once written out cannot grow different and, once rendered, can ask for nothing but, at most, to be rendered over again. In truth, however, man is an animal, a portion of the natural flux, and the consequence is that his nature has a moving center, his functions an external reference, and his ideal a true ideality. What he strives to preserve in preserving himself is something which he never has been at any particular moment. He maintains his equilibrium by motion. His goal is, in a sense, beyond him, since it is not his experience, but a form which all experience ought to receive. The inmost texture of his being is propulsive, and there is nothing more intimately bound up with his success than mobility and devotion to transcendent aims. If there is a transitive function in knowledge and an unselfish purpose in love, that is only because, at bottom, there is a self-reproductive, flying essence in all existence. If the equilibrium of man's being were stable, he would need neither nutrition, reproduction, nor sense. As it is, sense must renew his ideas and guide his instincts, otherwise than as their inner evolution would demand, and regenerative processes must strive to repair beneath the constant irreparable lapse of his substance. His business is to create and remodel those organisms in which ideals are bred. In order to have a soul to save, he must perpetually form it anew. He must, so to speak, earn his own living. In this vital labor, you may ask, is nutrition or reproduction the deeper function? Or to put the corresponding moral question, is the body or the state the primary good? If we view the situation from the individual side as self-consciousness might view it, we may reply that nutrition is fundamental, for if the body were not nourished, every faculty would decay. Could nutrition only succeed and keep the body young, reproduction would be unnecessary. With its poor pretense at maintaining the mobile human form in a series of examples. On the other hand, if we view the matter from above, as science and philosophy should, we may say that nutrition is but germination of a pervasive sort that the body is a tabernacle in which the transmissible human spirit is carried for a while, a shell for the immortal seed that dwells in it and has created it. This seed, however, for rational estimation, is merely a means to the existence and happiness of individuals. Transpersonal and continuous in its own fluid being, the potential grows personal in its ideal fulfillments. In other words, this potentiality is material, though called sometimes an idea, and has its only value in the particular creatures it may produce. Reproduction is accordingly primary and more completely instrumental than nutrition is. 
since it serves a soul as yet non-existent, while nutrition is useful to a soul that already has some actuality. Reproduction initiates life and remains at life's core, a function without which no other in the end will be possible. It is more central, crucial, and representative than nutrition, which is in a way peripheral only. It is a more typical and rudimentary act, marking the ideal's first victory over the universal flux before any higher function than reproduction itself has accrued to the animal. To nourish an existing being is to presuppose a pause in generation, the nucleus, before it dissolves into other individuals, gathers about itself for its own glory, certain temporal and personal faculties. It lives for itself, while in procreation it signs its own death warrant, makes its will, and institutes its heir. The situation has its counterpart in feeling. Replenishment is a sort of delayed breathing, as if the animal had to hunt for air. It necessitates more activity than it contains. It engages external senses in its service and promotes intelligence. After securing a dumb satisfaction, or even in preparing it, it leaves the habits it employed free for observation and ideal exercise. Reproduction, on the contrary, depletes. It is an expensive spirit, a drag on physical and mental life. It entangles rather than liberates. It fuses the soul again into the impersonal blind flux. Yet, since it constitutes the primary and central triumph of life, it is in itself more ideal and generous than nutrition. It fascinates the will in an absolute fashion, and the pleasures it brings are largely spiritual. For though the instrumentalities of reproduction may seem gross and trivial from a conventional point of view, its essence is really ideal, the perfect type, indeed, of ideality, since form and an identical life are therein sustained successfully by a more rhythmical flux of matter. It may seem fanciful, even if not unmeaning, to say that a man's soul more truly survives in his son's youth than in his own decrepitude, but this principle grows more obvious as we descend to simpler beings in which individual life is less elaborated and has not entrenched itself in so many advantageous and somewhat permanent organs. In vegetables, soul and seed go forth together and leave nothing but a husk behind. In the human individual, love may seem a mere incident of youth and a sentimental madness, but that episode, if we consider the rays, is indispensable to the whole drama, and if we look to the order in which ideal interests have grown up and to their superposition and moral experience, love will seem the truly primitive and initiatory passion. Consciousness, amused ordinarily by the most superficial processes, itself bears witness to the underlying claims of reproduction and is drawn by it for a moment into life's central vortex. And love, while it betrays its deep roots by the imperative force it exerts and the silence it imposes on all current passions, betrays also its ideal mission by casting an altogether novel and poetic spell over the mind. The conscious quality of his passion differs so much in various races and individuals and at various points in the same life that no account of it will ever satisfy everybody. Poets and 
novelists never tire of depicting it anew, but although the experience they tell of is fresh and unparalleled in every individual, their rendering suffers on the whole from a great monotony. Love's gesture and symptoms are noted and unvarying. Its vocabulary is poor and worn. Even a poet, therefore, can give of love but a meager expression, while the philosopher who renounces dramatic representation is condemned to be avowedly inadequate. Love to the lover is a noble and immense inspiration. To the naturalist, it is a thin veil and prelude to the self-assertion of lust. This opposition has prevented philosophers from doing justice to the subject. Two things need to be admitted by anyone who would not go wholly astray in such speculation. One, that love has an animal basis. The other, that it has an ideal object. Since these two propositions have usually been thought contradictory, no writer has ventured to present more than half the truth and that half out of its true relations. Plato, who gave eloquent expression to the ideal burden of the passion and divined its political and cosmic message, passed over its natural history with a few mythical fancies, and Schopenhauer, into whose system a naturalistic treatment would have fitted so easily, allowed his metaphysics to carry him at this point into verbal inanities. While, of course, like all profane writers on the subject, he failed to appreciate the oracles which Plato had delivered. In popular feeling, where sentiment and observation must both make themselves felt somehow or other, The tendency is to imagine that love is an absolute, non-natural energy which, for some unknown reason, or for none at all, lights upon particular persons and rests there eternally, as on its ultimate goal. In other words, it makes the origin of love divine and its objects natural, which is the exact opposite of the truth. If it were once seen, however, that every ideal expresses some natural function, and that no natural function is incapable in its free exercise of evolving some ideal and finding justification, not in some collateral animal, but in an inherent operation like life or thought, which being transmissible in its form is also eternal then the philosophy of love should not prove permanently barren. For love is a brilliant illustration of a principle everywhere discoverable, namely, that human reason lives by turning the friction of material forces into the light of ideal goods. There can be no philosophic interest in disguising the animal basis of love or in denying its spiritual sublimations. Since all life is animal in its origin, and all spiritual in its possible fruits. Plastic matter, in transmitting its organization, takes various courses which it is the part of natural history to describe. Even after reproduction has become sexual, it will offer no basis for love if it does not require a union of the two parent bodies. Did germinal substances unconsciously diffuse, meet by chance in the external medium, and unite there, it is obvious that whatever obsessions or pleasures maturity might bring, they would not have the quality which men call love. But when an individual of the opposite sex must be met with, recognized, and pursued, and must prove responsive, then each is haunted by the possible other. Each feels in a generic way the presence and attraction 
of his fellows. He vibrates to their touch. He dreams of their image. He is restless and wistful if alone. When the vague need that solicits him is met by the presence of a possible mate, it is extraordinarily kindled. Then, if it reaches fruition, it subsides immediately, and after an interval, perhaps of stupor and vital recuperation, the animal regains his independence, his peace, and his impartial curiosity. You might think him on the way to becoming intelligent, but the renewed nutrition and cravings of the sexual machinery soon engross his attention again. All his sprightly indifference vanishes before nature's categorical imperative. That fierce and turbid pleasure by which his obedience is rewarded hastens his dissolution. Every day the ensuing lassitude and emptiness give him a clear premonition of death. It is not figuratively only that his soul has passed into his offspring. The vocation to reduce them was a chief part of his being, and when that function is sufficiently fulfilled, he is superfluous in the world and becomes partly superfluous even to himself. The confines of his dream are narrowed. He moves apathetically and dies forlorn. Some echo of the vital rhythm which pervades not merely the generations of animals, but the seasons and the stars, emerges sometimes in consciousness. On reaching the tropics in the mortal ecliptic, which the human individual may touch many times without much change in his outer fortunes. The soul may occasionally divine that it is passing through a supreme crisis. Passion, when vehement, may bring atavistic sentiments. When love is absolute, it feels a profound impulse to welcome death. And even by a transcendental confusion to invoke the end of the universe. The human soul reverts at such a moment to what an ephemeral insect might feel. Buzzing till it finds its mate in the noon, its whole destiny was wooing, and that mission accomplished, it sings its nunc dimittis, renouncing heartily all irrelevant things. Now that the one fated and all-satisfying good has been achieved, where parental instincts exist also, nature soon shifts her loom, a milder impulse succeeds, and a satisfaction of a gentler sort follows in the birth of children. The transcendental illusion is here corrected, and it is seen that the extinction the lovers had accepted needed not to be complete. The death they welcomed was not without its little resurrection. The feeble worm they had generated bore their immortality within it. The varieties of sexual economy are many and to each may correspond, for all we know, a special sentiment. Sometimes the union established is intermittent. Sometimes it crowns the end of life and dissolves it altogether. Sometimes it remains, while it lasts, monogamous. Sometimes the sexual and social alertness is constant in the male, only periodic in the female. Sometimes the group established for procreation endures throughout the seasons and from year to year. Sometimes the males herd together as if normally they preferred their own society until the time of rut comes when war arises between them for the possession of what they have just discovered to be the fair.
A naturalist not ashamed to indulge his poetic imagination might easily paint for us the drama of these diverse loves. It suffices for our own purpose to observe that the varying passions and duties which life can contain depend upon the organic functions of the animal. A fish, incapable of coition, absolved from all care for its young, which it never sees or never distinguishes from the casual swimmers darting across its path. Such a fish, being without social faculties or calls to cooperation, cannot have the instincts, perceptions, or emotions which belong to social beings. The male of some higher species that feels only once a year the sudden solicitation of love cannot be sentimental in all the four seasons. His headlong passion, exhausted upon its present object and dismissed at once without remainder, leaves his senses perfectly free and colorless to scrutinize his residual world. Whatever further fears or desires may haunt him will have nothing mystical or sentimental about them. He will be a man of business all the year round and a lover only on May Day. A female that does not suffice for the rearing of her young will expect and normally receive her maid's aid long after the pleasures of love are forgotten by him. Disinterested fidelity on his part will then be her right and his duty. But a female that, once pregnant, needs like the hen no further cooperation on the male's part will turn from him at once with absolute indifference to brood perpetually on her eggs, undisturbed by the least sense of solitude or jealousy. And the chicks that at first follow her and find shelter under her wings will soon be forgotten also and relegated to the mechanical landscape. There is no pain in the timely snapping of the dearest bonds where society has not become a permanent organism and perpetual friendship is not one of its possible modes. Transcendent and ideal passions may well judge themselves to have an incomparable dignity, yet that dignity is hardly more than what every passion, were it articulate, would assign to itself and to its objects. The dumbness of a passion may accordingly, from one point of view, be called the index of its baseness, for if it cannot ally itself with ideas, its affinities can hardly lie in the rational mind, nor its advocates be among the poets. But if we listen to the master passion itself rather than to loquacious arts it may have enlisted in its service, we shall understand that it is not self-condemned because it is silent, nor an anomaly in nature because inharmonious with human life. The fish's heartlessness is his virtue. The male bee's lasciviousness is his vocation, and if these functions were retrenched or encumbered in order to assimilate them to human excellence, they would be merely dislocated. We should not produce virtue where there was vice but defeat a possible arrangement which would have had its own vitality and order. Animal love is a marvelous force, and while it issues in acts that may be followed by revulsion of feeling, it yet deserves a more sympathetic treatment than art and morals have known how to accord it. Erotic poets, to hide their want of ability to make the dumb passion speak, have played feebly with veiled insinuations and comic effects, while more serious sonneteers have harped exclusively on secondary and somewhat literary emotions, abstractly 
conjugating the verb to love. Capricious, in spite of his didactic turns, has been on this subject too the most ingenious and magnificent of poets. Although he chose to confine his description to the external history of sexual desire, it is a pity that he did not turn with his sublime sincerity to the inner side of it also and write the drama of the awakened senses, the poignant suasion of beauty when it clouds the brain and makes the conventional earth seen through that bright haze seem a sorry fable. Western poets should not have despised what the Orientals in their fugitive stanzas seem often to have sung most exquisitely, the joy of gazing on the beloved, of following or being followed, of tacit understandings and avowals, of flight together into some solitude to people it with those ineffable confidences which so naturally follow the outward proofs of love. All this makes the brightest page of many a life, the only bright page in the thin biography of many a human animal. While if the beasts could speak, they would give us, no doubt, endless versions of the only joy in which, as we may fancy, the blood of the universe flows consciously through their hearts. The darkness which conventionally covers this passion is one of the saddest consequences of Adam's fall. It was a terrible misfortune in man's development that he should not have been able to acquire the higher functions without deranging the lower. Why should the depths of his being be thus polluted and the most delightful of nature's mysteries be an occasion not for communion with her, as it should have remained, but for depravity and sorrow? This question, asked in moral perplexity, admits of a scientific answer. Man, in becoming more complex, becomes less stably organized. His sexual instinct, instead of being intermittent, but violent and boldly declared, becomes practically constant, but is entangled in many cross-currents of desire and many other equally imperfect adaptations of structure to various ends. Indulgence in any impulse can then easily become excessive and thwart the rest, for it may be aroused artificially and maintained from without, so that in turn it disturbs its neighbors. Sometimes the sexual instinct may be stimulated out of season by example, by a too wakeful fancy, by language, by pride, for all these forces are now working in the same field and intermingling their suggestions. At the same time, the same instinct may derange others and make them fail at their proper and pressing occasions. In consequence of such derangements, Reflection and public opinion will come to condemn what in itself was perfectly innocent. The corruption of a given instinct by others and of others by it becomes the ground for long attempts to suppress or enslave it. With the haste and formalism natural to language and to law, external and arbitrary limits are set to its operation as no inward adjustment can possibly correspond to these conventional barriers and compartments of life. A war between nature and morality breaks out both in society and in each particular bosom. A war in which every victory is a sorrow and every defeat a dishonor. As one instinct after another becomes furious or disorganized, cowardly or criminal, under these artificial restrictions, the public and private conscience 
turns against it all its forces. Necessarily, without much nice discrimination, the frank passions of youth are met with a grimace of horror on all sides, with remores senum superiorum, with an insistence on reticence and hypocrisy. Such suppression is favorable to corruption. The fancy with a sort of idiotic ingenuity comes to supply the place of experience, and nature is rendered vicious and overlaid with pruriency, artifice, and the love of novelty. Hereupon the authorities that rule in such matters naturally redouble their vigilance and exaggerate their reasonable censure. Chastity begins to seem essentially holy and perpetual virginity ends by becoming an absolute ideal. Thus the disorder in man's life and disposition, when grown intolerable, leads him to condemn the very elements out of which order might have been constituted, and to mistake his total confusion for his total depravity. Banished from the open day, covered with mockery and publicly ignored, this necessary pleasure flourishes none the less in dark places and in the secret soul. Its familiar presence there, its intimate habitation in what is most oneself, helps to cut the world in two and to separate the inner from the outer life. And that mysticism, which cannot disguise its erotic affinities, this disruption reaches an absolute and theoretic form. But in many a youth little suspected of mysticism, it produces estrangement from the conventional moralizing world, which he instinctively regards as artificial and alien. It prepares him for excursions into a private fairyland in which unthought of joys will blossom amid friendlier magic forces. The truly good, then, seems to be the fantastic, the sensuous, the prodigally unreal. He gladly forgets the dreary world he lives in to listen for a thousand and one nights to his dreams. This is the region where those who have no conception of the life of reason place the ideal, and an ideal is indeed there but the ideal of a single and inordinate impulse. A rational mind, on the contrary, moves by preference in the real world, cultivating all human interests in due proportion. The lovesick and luxurious dreamland dear to irrational poets is a distorted image of the ideal world, but this distortion has still an ideal motive, since it is made to satisfy the cravings of a forgotten part of the soul and to make a home for those elements in human nature which have been denied over existence. If the ideal is meantime so sadly caricatured, the fault lies with the circumstances of life that have not allowed the sane will adequate exercise. Lack of strength and of opportunity makes it impossible for man to preserve all his interests in a just harmony and his conscious ideal, springing up as it too often does in protest against suffering and tyranny, has not scope and range enough to include the natural opportunities for action. Nature herself, by making a slave of the body, has thus made a tyrant of the soul. Fairyland and a mystical heaven contain many other factors besides that furnished by unsatisfied and objectless love. All sensuous and verbal images may breed after their own kind in an empty brain, but these fantasies are often 
supported and directed by sexual longings and vaguely luxurious thoughts. An oriental paradise, with its delicate but mindless aestheticism, is above everything a garden for love. To brood on such an elysium is a likely prelude and fertile preparation for romantic passion. When the passion takes form, it calls fancy back from its loose reveries and fixes it upon a single object. Then the ideal seems at last to have been brought down to earth. Its embodiment has been discovered amongst the children of men. Imagination narrows her range. Instead of all sorts of flatteries to sense and improbable, delicious adventures, the lover imagines but a single joy, to be master of his love in body and soul. Jealousy pursues him. Even if he dreads no physical betrayal, he suffers from terror and morbid sensitiveness at every hint of mental estrangement. This attachment is often the more absorbing, the more unaccountable it seems. And as in hypnotism, the subject is dead to all influences but that of the operator. So in love, the heart surrenders itself entirely to the one being that has known how to touch it. That being is not selected. It is recognized and obeyed. Prearranged reactions in the system respond to whatever stimulus at a propitious moment happens to break through and arouse them pervasively. Nature has opened various avenues to that passion in whose successful operation she has so much at stake. Sometimes the magic influence asserts itself suddenly, sometimes gently and unawares. One approach which in poetry has usurped more than its share of attention is through beauty. Another less glorious, but often more efficacious, through surprise, sense, and premonitions of pleasure, a third through social sympathy and moral affinities. Contemplation, sense, and association are none of them the essences, or even the seed of love. But any of them may be its soil and supply it with a propitious background. It would be mere sophistry to pretend, for instance, that love is or should be nothing but a moral bond, the sympathy of two kindred spirits or the union of two lives. For such, in effect, no passion would be needed as none is needed to perceive beauty or to feel pleasure. What Aristotle calls friendships of utility, pleasure, or virtue, all resting on common interests of some impersonal sort, are far from possessing the quality of love. It's thrill, flutter, and absolute sway over happiness and misery but it may well fall to such influences to awaken or feed the passion where it actually arises. Whatever circumstances pave the way, love does not itself appear until a sexual affinity is declared. When a woman, for instance, contemplating marriage, asks herself whether she really loves her suitor or merely accepts him, the test is the possibility of awakening a sexual affinity. For this reason, women of the world often love their husbands more truly than they did their lovers, because marriage has evoked an elementary feeling which before lay smothered under a heap of coquetries, vanities, and conventions, and conventions. Man, on the contrary, is polygamous by instinct, although often kept faithful by habit no less than by duty. If his fancy is left free, it is apt to wonder. We 
we observe is in romantic passion no less than in a life of mere gallantry and pleasure. Sentimental illusions may become a habit, and the shorter the dream is, the more often it is repeated, so that any susceptible poet may find that he, like Alfred de Musset, must love incessantly, who once has loved. Love is indeed much less exacting than it thinks itself. Nine-tenths of its cause are in the lover, or one-tenth that may be in the object. Were the latter not accidentally at hand, an almost identical passion would probably have been felt for someone else. For although with acquaintance the quality of an attachment naturally adapts itself to the person loved and makes that person its standard and ideal, the first assault and mysterious glow of the passion is much the same for every object. What really affects the character of love is the lover's temperament, age, and experience. The objects that appeal to each man reveal his nature, but those unparalleled virtues and that unique divinity which the lover discovers there are reflections of his own adoration. Things that ecstasy is very cunning in. He loves what he imagines and worships what he creates. Those who do not consider these matters so curiously may feel that to refer love in this way chiefly to inner processes is at once ignominious and fantastic, but nothing could be more natural. The soul accurately renders in this experience what is going on in the body and in the race. Nature had a problem to solve in sexual reproduction, which would have daunted a less ruthless experimenter. She had to bring together automatically and at the dictation, as they felt, of their irresponsible wills, just the creatures that by uniting might reproduce the species. The complete sexual reaction had to be woven together out of many incomplete reactions to various stimuli, reactions not specifically sexual. The outer senses had to be engaged, and many secondary characters found in bodies had to be used to attract attention, until the deeper instinctive response should have time to gather itself together and assert itself openly. Many mechanical preformations and reflexes must conspire to constitute a determinate instinct. We name this instinct after its ultimate function, looking forward to the uses we observe it to have, and it seems to us in consequence an inexplicable anomaly that many a time the instinct is set in motion when its alleged purpose cannot be fulfilled as when love appears prematurely or too late, or fixes upon a creature of the wrong age or sex. These anomalies show us how nature is built up and, far from being inexplicable, are hints that tend to make everything clear, when once a verbal and mythical philosophy has been abandoned. Responses which we may call sexual in view of results to which they may ultimately lead are thus often quite independent and exist before they are drawn into the vortex of a complete and actually generative act. External stimulus and present idea will consequently be altogether inadequate to explain the profound upheaval which may ensue. If, as we say, we actually fall in love, that the senses should be played upon is nothing, if no deeper reaction is aroused, all depends on the juncture at which, so to speak, the sexual circuit is completed and the emotional currents begin to circulate. Whatever object, at such a critical moment, fills the field of consciousness 
becomes a signal and associate for the whole sexual mood. It is breathlessly devoured in that pause and concentration of attention, that rearrangement of the soul which love is conceived in, and the whole new life which that image is engulfed is foolishly supposed to be its effect. For the image is in consciousness, but not the profound predispositions which give it place and power. This association between passion and its signals may be merely momentary, or it may be perpetual. A Don Juan and a Dante are both genuine lovers. In a gay society, the gallant addresses every woman as if she charmed him, and perhaps actually finds any kind of beauty or mere femininity anywhere a sufficient spur to his desire. These momentary fascinations are not necessarily false. They may, for an instant, be quite absorbing and irresistible. They may genuinely suffuse the whole mind. Such mercurial fire will indeed require a certain imaginative temperament, and there are many persons who, short of a lifelong domestic attachment, can conceive of nothing but sordid vice. But even an inconstant flame may burn brightly if the soul is naturally combustible. Indeed, these sparks and glints of passion, just because they come and vary so quickly, offer admirable illustrations of it, in which it may be viewed, so to speak, under the microscope and in its formative stage. Thus Plato did not hesitate to make the love of all wines, under whatever guise, excuse, or occasion, the test of a true taste for wine, and an unfeigned adoration of Bacchus, and, like Lucretius after him, he wittily compiled a list of names by which the lover will flatter the most opposite qualities, if they only succeed in arousing his inclination. To be omnivorous is one pole of a true lover, to be exclusive is the other. A man whose heart, if I may say so, lies deeper, hidden under a thicker coat of mail, will have less play of fancy, and will be far from finding every charm charming, or every sort of beauty a stimulus to love. Yet he may not be less prone to the tender passion and when once smitten, may be so penetrated by an unimagined tenderness and joy that he will declare himself incapable of ever loving again, and may actually be so. Having no rivals and a deeper soil, love can ripen better in such a constant spirit. It will not waste itself in a continual patter of little pleasures and illusions but unless the passion of it is to die down, it must somehow assert its universality. What it loses in diversity, it must gain in applicability. It must become a principle of action and an influence, coloring everything that is dreamt of. Otherwise, it would have lost its dignity and sunk into a dead memory or a domestic bond. True love, it used to be said, is love at first sight. Manners have much to do with such incidents, and the race which happens to set at a given time the fashion in literature makes its temperament public and exercises a sort of contagion over all men's fancies. If women are rarely seen and ordinarily not to be spoken to, if all imagination has to build upon is a furtive glance or a casual motion, people fall in love at first sight. They must fall in love somehow, and any stimulus is enough if none more powerful is forthcoming. When society, on the contrary, allows constant and easy intercourse between the sexes, a first impression, if not reinforced, 
will soon be hidden and obliterated by others. Acquaintance becomes necessary for love when it is necessary for memory. But what makes true love is not the information conveyed by acquaintance, not any circumstantial charms that may be therein discovered. It is still a deep and dumb instinctive affinity, an inexplicable emotion seizing the heart, an influence organizing the world like a luminous crystal about one magic point, so that although love seldom springs up suddenly in these days into anything like a full-blown passion, it is sight, it is presence, that makes in time a conquest over the heart, for all virtues, sympathies, confidences will fail to move a man to tenderness and to worship unless a poignant effluence from the object envelop him so that he begins to walk, as it were, in a dream. Not to believe in love is a great sign of dullness. There are some people so indirect and lumbering that they think all real affection must rest on circumstantial evidence. But a finely constituted being is sensitive to its deepest affinities. This is precisely what refinement consists in, that we may feel in things immediate and infinitesimal a sure premonition of things ultimate and important. Fine senses vibrate at once to harmonies which it may take long to verify. So sight is finer than touch, and thought than sensation. Well-bred instinct meets reason halfway, and is prepared for the consonances that may follow. Beautiful things, when taste is formed, are obviously and uncountably beautiful. The grounds we may bring ourselves to assign for our preferences are discovered by analyzing those preferences, and articulate judgments follow upon emotions which they ought to express, but which they sometimes sophisticate. So too the reasons we give for love either express what it feels or else are insincere, attempting to justify at the bar of reason and convention something which is far more primitive than they and underlies them both. True instinct can dispense with such excuses. It appeals to the event and is justified by the response which nature makes to it. It is, of course, far from infallible, it cannot dominate circumstances, and has no discursive knowledge. But it is presumably true, and what it foreknows is always essentially possible. Unrealizable it may indeed be in the jumbled context of this world, where the fates, like an absent-minded printer, seldom allow a single line to stand perfect and unmarred. The profoundest affinities are those most readily felt, and though a thousand later considerations may overlay and override them, they remain a background and standard for all happiness. If we trace them out, we succeed. If we put them by, although in other respects we may call ourselves happy, we inwardly know that we have dismissed the ideal, and all that was essentially possible has not been realized. Love, in that case, still owns a hidden and potential object, and we sanctify, perhaps, whatever kindnesses or partialities we indulge in by a secret loyalty to something impersonal and unseen. Such reserve, such religion, would not have been necessary had things responded to our first expectations. We might then have identified the ideal with the object that happened to call it forth. The life of reason might have been led instinctively, and we might have been guided by nature herself into the ways of peace. As it is, circumstances, false steps, or the mere lapse of time, 
forces to shuffle our affections and take them as they come, or as we are suffered to indulge them. A mother is followed by a boyish friend, a friend by a girl, a girl by a wife, a wife by a child, a child by an idea. A divinity passes through these various temples. They may all remain standing, and we may continue our cult in them without outward change long after the god has fled from the last into his native heaven. We may try to convince ourselves that we have lost nothing when we have lost all. We may take comfort in praising the mixed and perfunctory attachments which cling to us by force of habit and duty, repeating the empty names of creatures that have long ceased to be what we once could love and assuring ourselves that we have remained constant without admitting that the world, which is in irreparable flux, has from the first been betraying us. Ashamed of being so deeply deceived, we may try to smile cynically at the glory that once shone upon us and call it a dream, but cynicism is wasted on the ideal. There is indeed no idol ever identified with the ideal which honest experience, even without cynicism, will not someday unmask and discredit. Every real object must cease to be what it seemed, and none could ever be what the whole soul desired. Yet what the soul desires is nothing arbitrary. Life is no objectless dream, but continually embodies with varying success the potentialities it contains and that prompt desire. Everything that satisfies at all, even if partially and for an instant, justifies aspiration and rewards it. Existence, however, cannot be arrested, and only the transmissible forms of things can endure to match the transmissible faculties which living beings hand down to one another. The ideal is accordingly significant, perpetual, and as constant as the nature it expresses, but it can never itself exist, nor can its particular embodiments endure. Love is accordingly only half an illusion. The lover, but not his love, is deceived. His madness, as Plato thought, is divine, for though it be folly to identify the idol with the god, faith in the god is inwardly justified. That egregious idolatry may therefore be interpreted ideally and given a symbolic scope worthy of its natural causes and of the mystery it comes to celebrate. The lover knows much more about absolute good and universal beauty than any logician or theologian, unless the latter two be lovers in disguise. Logical universals are terms in discourse without vital ideality, while traditional gods are at best natural existences, more or less indifferent facts. What the lover comes upon, on the contrary, is truly pervasive and witnesses to itself so that he worships from the heart and beholds what he worships. That the true object is no natural being, but an ideal form essentially eternal and capable of endless embodiments is far from abolishing its worth. On the contrary, this fact makes love ideally relevant to generation by which the human soul and body may be forever renewed, and at the same time makes it a thing for large thoughts to be focused upon, a thing representing all rational aims. Whenever this ideality is absent and a lover sees nothing in his mistress but what everyone else may find in her, loving her honestly in her unvarnished and accidental person, there is a friendly and humorous affection, admirable in itself, but no passion or bewitchment of love. She is a member of his group, 
not a spirit in his pantheon. Such an affection may be altogether what it should be. It may bring a happiness all the more stable because the heart is quite whole. No divine shaft has pierced it. It is hard to staunch wounds inflicted by a god. The glance of an ideal love is terrible and glorious, foreboding death and immortality together. Love could not be called divine without platitude if it regarded nothing but its nominal object. To be divine, it must not envisage an accidental good, but the principle of goodness. That which gives other goods their ultimate meaning and makes all functions useful. Love is a true natural religion. It has a visible cult. It is kindled by natural beauties and bows to the best symbol it may find for its hope. It sanctifies a natural mystery and, finally, when understood, it recognizes that what it worshipped under a figure was truly the principle of all good. The loftiest edifices need the deepest foundations. Love would never take so high a flight unless it sprung from something profound and elementary. It is accordingly most truly love when it is irresistible and fatal. The substance of all passion, if we could gather it together, would be the basis of all ideals, to which all goods would have to refer. Love actually accomplishes something of the sort. Being primordial, it underlies other demands, and can be wholly satisfied only by a happiness which is ultimate and comprehensive. Lovers are vividly aware of this fact. Their ideal apparently so inarticulate, seems to them to include everything. It shares the mystical quality of all primitive love. Sophisticated people can hardly understand how vague experience is at bottom, and how truly that vagueness supports whatever clearness is afterward attained. They cling to the notion that nothing can have a spiritual scope that does not spring from reflection, but in that case, life itself, which brings reflection about, would never support spiritual interests, and all that is moral would be unnatural and consequently self-destructive. In truth, all spiritual interests are supposed by animal life. In this, the generative function is fundamental, and it is therefore no paradox, but something altogether fitting, that if that function realized all it comprises, nothing human would remain outside. Such an ultimate fulfillment would differ, of course, from a first satisfaction, just as all that reproduction reproduces differs from the reproductive function itself, and vastly exceeds it. All organs and activities which are inherited, in a sense, grow out of the reproductive process and serve to clothe it, so that when the generative energy is awakened, all that can ever be is virtually called up and, so to speak, made consciously potential, and love yearns for the universe of values. This secret is gradually revealed to those who are inwardly attentive and allow love to teach them something. A man who has truly loved, though he may come to recognize the thousand incidental illusions into which love may have led him, will not recant its essential faith. He will keep his sense for the ideal and his power to worship. The further objects by which these gifts will be entertained will vary with the situation. A philosopher, a soldier, and a courtesan will express the same religion in different ways. In fortunate cases, love may glide imperceptibly into subtle domestic affections, giving them henceforth a touch of ideality. For when love dies in the odor of sanctity, people venerate his relics. In other cases, allegiance to the ideal may appear more sullenly. 
breaking out in whims or in little sentimental practices which might seem half conventional. Again, it may inspire a religious conversion, charitable works, or even artistic labors. In all these ways, people attempt more or less seriously to lead the life of reason, expressing outwardly allegiance to whatever in their minds has come to stand for the ideal. If to create was love's impulse originally, to create is its effort still, after it had been chastened and has received some rational extension. The machinery which serves reproduction thus finds kindred but higher uses, as every organ does in a liberal life, and what Plato called a desire for birth and beauty may be sublimated even more until it yearns for an ideal immortality in a transfigured world, a world made worthy of that love which his children have so often lavished on it in their dreams.